Hi all. We're still in James Orr, Sidelights on Christian Doctrine. We've reached the chapter Man and Sin, Man's Nature and Original Condition. From the doctrines of creation and providence I pass to speak of the doctrines of man and sin. The doctrine of sin lies at the foundation of a right understanding of the doctrine of redemption. To understand a remedy you must understand the disease it is meant to cure. If sin be only a pin scratch on the surface of man's nature, the remedy needed for it will be correspondingly slight. If, on the other hand, sin is what the Bible declares it to be, a terrible and soul-destroying evil, then the greatest miracle and most stupendous sacrifice in the universe was required to effect man's salvation from it. But the doctrine of sin, again, rests on a right conception of the nature of man. With that, I accordingly begin. It was pointed out that the doctrine of God in the Bible was a unique doctrine, and that the doctrine of creation, as flowing from the doctrine of God, was not less unique. It is now to be shown that the Bible doctrine of man has the same character of uniqueness. It is a doctrine which stands altogether by itself. The Bible exalts man and abases him, as no other religion, religion on earth does, exalts him in picturing him as made in the image of God, and capable of eternal life, abases him in setting forth the depths of his apostasy from God, and his inability to deliver himself from the misery and ruin into which it has plunged him. It will be seen as we proceed that this doctrine stands in vital connection with all the other parts of divine truth in the Bible. It may be proper to begin by speaking for a little on what the Bible has to say of man's place in creation. We touch here a subject on which it will be recognized that there is and can be no conflict between the Bible and science. According to the Bible, man's place is at the summit of creation. He is the last and highest of God's created works, the goal and consummation of the whole creative process. When you turn to science, you find the same affirmation, expressed in almost the same terms. Evolutionary philosophy has no cavil to make here. For it, also, man is the last and highest product of nature. He stands, as in the Bible, at the head of creation, is the micro microcosm of it, gathers up into himself all that has gone before, is the apex of creation. It is not, so far as I know, expected by anyone that man will ever develop into something specifically different from, or higher than, the humanity we know. All further development, whatever its nature, is always assumed to be within humanity. Another point on which there would seem to be no longer any difficulty or disagreement possible between the Bible and science is the unity of the human race. There was a time, not so long ago, when scientific men were accustomed to speak of centers of creation. They advocated the view that there were separate centers of creation of the race of man, and that the creation of the Bible was the, the creation of only an Adamic race. This view, thanks, it must be owned, chiefly to evolutionary science, is now mostly gone. That man was made ma male and female, and that from an original single pair, the whole human race has descended, is the universal verdict of science. It is a very singular thing that while science was disputing about the unity of man, the Bible was affirming it all the time, for instance in Acts 17, verse 26. But there is something more to be said. If we take the complete Bible view of man, we find that man not only stands at the summit of nature, but stands also above nature, as belonging to a higher spiritual realm. If man on the lower side of his being is linked with organic nature, sums it up in himself, is its crown and apex, it is not less true that on another side of his being, he is, as Bushnell finally argues in his work Nature and the Supernatural, man is supranatural. He is linked with a higher spiritual order, belongs to a higher spiritual world in which he finds his true life. He is, as Herder said, the middle link between two systems of creation. He binds them together, holds them in his own person as a unity. Does not this fit in most beautifully with the structure of Bible revelation in all that it teaches about the destiny of man and the place which our humanity now holds in the universe through Christ? 
it will be remembered that it will be remembered what is said on this subject in Ephesians 1 and Hebrews 2. It is the purpose of God, we are told, to sum up all things in Christ, Ephesians 1.10. Christ stands there in our humanity, connecting all the parts of the universe together. All things are put in subjection under his feet. The writer of Hebrews quotes the 8th Psalm and says, We see not yet all things subjected to him, that is man, but we hold him, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 9. Christ thus, ruling in our humanity, unites, or will unite, the whole redeemed universe in his own person. And it is because of this constitution of man's nature, uniting the physical with the spiritual, that he is fitted to occupy this position in God's creation. So I'm putting a link on your screen to the centrality of the resurrection especially for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, this is a very important point because the resurrection is obviously such a, such a central teaching, not foundation teaching to all New Testament teaching. And yet, when you're in the Jehovah's Witnesses, you wouldn't know that. Why is the resurrection so important? Well, because of this unity of man's spiritual and physical nature, that man is not complete until his spiritual and his physical body are reunited. So, the centrality of the resurrection. I'll put that video on your screen and next time, man the image of God.